David Hockney is here. He is considered to be one of Britain's greatest contemporary artists. Yet he is perhaps best known for immortalizing the city of Los Angeles in art. Over the years, his paintings and photography have reflected his fascination with swimming pools and the landscape of California. Recently, he put down his paintbrush to concentrate on a new book. Secret Knowledge is Hockney's study of the use of optics in the works of the great masters. His theory that Western art has been dependent on optical devices for 400 years is at the center of a debate in the art world. I'm pleased to welcome David Hockney to this table for a conversation about this, and my hope that later on we'll go to Los Angeles and do a profile of him about all of his work. Welcome. Well, thank you. Great to me. have you here. <laughs> <laughs> I already like you. Uh, you. You are going to come to New York, and to Saturday morning you're going to have it out and explain exactly what your theory is, and you've brought all these art historians together, and it's go mano mano. Well, I didn't do it. Ren Weschler did okay. that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and actually, it's not just my theory. Lots of other people would share it as well. I've just probably pushed it uh, a little further back than uh, people thought. That's all. Uh, but uh, I think there's lots of people thought the same thing for a long time. And what are we talking about? We're talking about optical projections, uh, which, after all, that's what television is. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, and they were used by artists. Now, uh, how were they made? People think, most people think cameras were invented in the 19th century, uh, but uh, they're very old, actually. In fact, it's perfectly natural. Uh, it's uh, a natural thing. Uh, a pinhole in a room produces an mm. image on the opposite wall. But uh, people have thought that lenses developed by the 17th century. But we did discover, uh, the main discovery I made was it was possible to make projections with a mirror not just a lens. Yeah. Now that was not known in the world of art. It was known in the world of science, but of course they're very far apart uh, today. They weren't, of course, in the 15th century. But I found that out when we found it out and did it. I mean, meaning actually anybody can do it at home. Uh, any shaving mirror or yeah. makeup mirror is uh, a concave mirror. And so what would you do at home? Uh, <clears throat> if you take a very bright window mm -hmm. uh, and the room is reasonably dark and you uh, hold the mirror up at the edge of the window, yeah. you will get a picture of what's across the street upside yeah. down on the wall uh, in color and it will move. Okay, uh, now what are you saying? Let's take that image because they can get it now. Take that image, and what's the, what are what would artists do? How would they use that image? Well, first of all, they'd be rather thrilled. I mean, we were thrilled when we saw it, you know, last year. So, six hundred years ago, they would be very, very thrilled. In fact, probably even frightened of it because it's magical. It yeah. seems magical. And you got to remember, no cameras at that time, and in fact you believe photography killed this? Well, remember, no, there were cameras. Photography uh, is a chemical invention. Well, I understand. You see, uh, they know there were cameras. I mean, the, oh, first, yeah, because cameras. the first photographs were made with cameras that were made for landscape artists. Yeah. Naturally, they weren't made for photographers. That's what they used. And uh, so, but that's known only until, as I say, the date about the it's the 17th century. Uh, to take it back 200 years before that, uh, you have to involve some, we know probably they weren't lenses, but there were mirrors. Uh, and there's certainly a mirror at the back of Mr. and Mrs. Arnold Feeney. Yeah. That's a convex mirror, but the back of a convex mirror is a concave mirror. Uh, it's just going the other way. And that would project an image of that chandelier onto the uh, canvas. In fact, we did it. We had a chandelier made, a replica, and with a mirror just four and a half inches in diameter, 
projected it the exact size it is in Van Eyck's painting. And then what did you do? Well, I then assumed, well, he would have known this. Yeah. Um, and here was a technique to draw this very difficult uh, chandelier uh, with uh, this equipment. We know that equipment existed uh, in 1430. Why would you assume that great artists would use it? Because artists would use any tool available. Uh, why wouldn't they? I mean, it seems to me odd to assume they wouldn't, actually. That's odd. Uh, remember, nobody's ever seen a photograph. Nobody. You're seeing the three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional plane. And we're all fascinated by yeah. that. That is not the appeal of television. It's yeah. not the appeal of uh, pictures. Uh, and this was a moving picture, remember? It's in color, and it's moving. And if you do it today, people are quite taken with it. I mean, when I was showing it to people in LA, just we set up uh, uh, with a cabbage outside a window, and there it was spinning round. I mean, people were. Yeah, they had no idea it could be done, actually. Um, and it's not written about, that is not written about. The uh, concave mirror uh, is not in text. Uh, why? Um, well, I think it's people would, artists would keep it secret. They would, actually. Uh, my original title for the book, of course, was Lost Knowledge. But the publishers thought secret knowledge would be better. Tells you like something inside and nobody knows. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was also lost. But listen to what the subtitle is, Rediscovering the Lost Techniques of the Old Masters. Do you have any doubt that they use this technique? No, I don't. No. You don't. I mean, you are 100% believe uh, it. To see them is to use them. I'm not suggesting, I don't know quite how, but once you've seen them, you know they use them because they look like paintings, actually. Uh, suddenly you've got, you know, tonalities made different. I mean, uh, harmonies uh, that are very beautiful. Some might say, okay, David, let's say you're right. So what? So what? Uh, the interesting thing is actually not because of art history in the past. The interesting thing is because of today, really, because in a sense, we're back to a hand in a camera. What I'm suggesting is the hand was in the camera for 400 years. Then chemicals were in the camera for 180. Yeah. But now there's digits in it. And that means digital camera. you can move things about. Anybody can. Yeah. Meaning you're drawing. It's not drawing. Yeah. If you're moving something about, that's what you're doing. Well, in a way, that's now getting very, very big. Are we therefore losing a veracity that we believed before for 170 years? We're therefore going back, uh, going forward and going back to the construction of pictures with the lens and the hand. Why haven't art historians all agreed with you? Why do many of them say, not so fast? Well, that's all they're saying. They're not disagreeing. No, okay, that's no, right. That's they're what they're disagreeing. saying. You can't, actually, because the science is there. Yeah. I want to come to this, because we've got this great video. Talk me through it as we look at this. We're, we're seeing what you're talking about. What is that? That's, uh, there's the projection of the baptistry. Uh, that's the mirror uh, on, a, uh, on a stand, you see. Uh, uh -huh. that's he's still got the handle on it yeah um, in fact still got the price on the back actually okay. but there is a clear projection of the baptistry right from that mirror now the laws of optics do not change that a mirror would have done that in 1420 and look at the lines I'm pointing out that because it's a octagonal building mm -hmm. you get the diagonal lines all I'm suggesting is Brunelleschi must have known this, seen it. Then, of course, he goes home and works out the mathematical laws of perspective.
Mm -hmm. But I think he had to see that first. And there's no reason he would tell anybody. He was a very secretive man. He didn't... Ah, oh, but see, there you come. There's no reason he would tell anybody. There isn't, really. W why wouldn't he tell anybody? He, he why would he not tell anybody? He didn't. I mean, after all, he was building the dome in Florence. And it's known how secretive he was. He would not tell them uh, how he was going to do it. You know, the famous story about the eggs. Uh, he suggests, uh, 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 how can you stand an egg up? Three eggs. Yeah. And they don't do it. And then he just squashes it and it stands up. And they each say, well, we could have done that. He said, yes, but you didn't. Yeah. And I did it. And I will do the dome. But he did not tell them. He did not tell all the people who were paying for it uh, exactly how he was going to do it because there were competitors. He's in business sure. as well. Something. So there are perfectly good reasons, it seems to me. And how can you deny, as I say, the science is there. Now, art historians would say he had a frame with uh, little squares and he'd have to look. What's the difference between the mirror doing it and doing that? Really? Yeah. Uh, now, do art historians believe this detracts from artists? Sorry, the, the, do they? Do the art historians who are not yet? The, know, nobody totally disagrees. I mean, what are we talking what's about? The, what's the point of dispute then? Well, I'm not sure myself. <laughs> actually, I've never been that sure. I've um, <clears throat> probably the, the 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 dates. As I say, the the mirror was not known about. Yeah. So we've shown that, we've demonstrated that. Now that does push, uh, you then can push it further back. Now, uh, one or two, I don't know the experts of Van Eyck, I don't uh, know them, but uh, certainly some of the experts on Caravaggio certainly agreed with me straight they did. away. Yes, they Absolutely. did. Absolutely. Yes, John Spike did. Yeah. Um, How about Vermeer? Uh, well, yes, and many people have said them. Uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Gowing's book a year yeah. ago just uh, assumed he used a camera. Didn't go into how. Yeah, they have always assumed that. It, that, it, it that doesn't matter how, actually. That's less important. The fact that this picture was seen. And remember, it's a moving picture in color. Um, how would you describe it before photography? Right. Let me see the other clip here. We'll take a look at this. This is. This will show you. What am I seeing here? Ah, this is, uh, again, this is a mirror projection of a friend of mine sitting outside in California. Uh, there he is. There's a hole. I have a hole in the wall. We had a mirror here. Yeah. Uh, back here. Projected it at the side there. I've made a few marks. Now I'm drawing from life. Yeah. And... This uh, was because of a van the only known Van Eyck drawing uh, seemed to me to look a bit like an Arn drawing, I thought. Really? It had this a certain optical look, what I call an optical look. And we demonstrated this here. I mean, my drawing is a bit crude. Uh, I did a better one. I got him dressed up as a cardinal, actually, <laughs> uh, more like Van Eyck. But yeah. nevertheless, uh, you produce, of course, it doesn't do the drawing. I did the drawing. I made the marks. The artist makes the marks. But so any kind of help that an artist gets to make his marks in no way detracts from his talent. No. I mean... Whatever. Uh, I mean, no, for example, it, let's assume it was... Remember, this is an ephemeral thing. These projections before photography... Uh, you could only see them for a short while, only when the sun is shining, when there's light there, uh, how many people yeah. would see them. Very few people would see them. Uh, photography, suddenly, this is on a piece of paper. So Perfect. if an artist uses a ruler or something to make a straight line? Uh, I think, I mean, I'm pretty certain that I'm right, actually, about it. Yes, I'm very certain. Um, I don't think... I don't think there's too much argument, actually. I think... Um, so what are you guys going to talk about on Saturday? Well, re remember, this is organized by Ren, who actually <laughs> wrote a piece in The New Yorker. And uh, certainly, I know there's quite a few people who will be there who yeah. have followed it and, yeah. uh, and agree. Yeah. It's just, 
Uh, I don't know the techniques used, but neither does anybody else. All right, let me take a look at some paintings here. Uh, let's take a look at the first one and tell me what we, what do we see here. Well, that was an Ang drawing. Right. Um, um, Madame I, Louise Francois um, got a... Now, I'm pointing out, look at the head, which yeah. is a tiny bit big, and her hands in relation to the head seem very high up. Yeah. You see that? I can see that. Meaning, there's the proportion is slightly odd, which I would have thought was caused by uh, him using a camera lucida. I also think the lines, especially of the clothes, those were the lines that reminded me of Warhol. Really? Yes. Uh, when I well, Warhol in, acknowledged that he used. Pardon? Didn't Warhol acknowledge that he used certain kinds of devices? Didn't he? Yes. Uh, well, uh, he would project a photograph. Right. But actually, even even Andy did them. He did them on his own. No one was there when he made his drawing. They do. Now, what does that idea. say to you? Well, it says, uh, tells you the same thing. I mean, people are a little bit secretive about uh, tools like that. I mean... So that's uh, why we call it secret knowledge. Yeah, I think. I mean, they're secretive today about techniques like that. Why, though? I want to keep going. Uh, Doesn't that suggest a certain sense of, well, maybe I'm, I don't want them to know that I'm... Yes, it does. But I think that's deep in our nature, perhaps. I mean, that's human nature about something. In the book, for instance, there's a story about um, uh, a Dutch painter, Terentius, and Christian Huygens had been to London and bought a camera in 1620, and he's demonstrating it to friends in The Hague. Yeah. And Terentius comes along and feigns ignorance about what is happening. He pretends to be, and Huygens notices this yeah. and realizes he's pretending he's <laughs> never seen it. Yeah. That's 1620. I think you still have that today, actually. I mean, uh, perhaps, uh, and Huygens said Terentius would have liked to have claimed total skill, you see. People wanted to think Oh, he did this. Just now, now, is the significance of your dis your premise significance of your premise that this occurs over a longer span of the history of Western art? Yes. Okay. Yes. Take a look at this. Speaking of that, this is Johann Vermeer, the milkman. Johannes Vermeer. Now, <coughs> marvelous picture. Absolutely yeah, marvelous picture. picture. Yeah. Somehow that milk seems to be running. Exactly. Isn't it? It's You're amazing. Right. It is amazing. Uh, very, very beautiful. Now, on the far wall of that is a basket that is quite in focus, actually, and then a shiny little piece of metal, you can see, but the basket in the foreground is actually out of focus. Now, we don't see out of focus. We don't. I mean, my, our eye moves. Uh, right, right, and, right. Uh, I think there are quite a lot of clues that he had seen projections, uh, and I, I suspect he had a perhaps a better lens than Caravaggio. Yeah. His neighbor, I mean, all right, they'll say Vermeer does no lenses. Caravaggio his was his neighbor? No, his uh, Vermeer's neighbor oh. was um, Mr. Lohenhoek, yeah. who made telescopes and made oh, lenses. Oh, yeah. Yes. Now, he was also the. Um, executor of his will. The lenses would belong to Mr. Lornhook, I suppose. He would lend them. I mean, he would know they would make pictures. Lenses make pictures. They're making one now. There you go. And All right, so no, all right go ahead. He would tell, I mean, Vermeer would look at it, and I'm sure because of the beautiful color, it tells me the lens was a bit bigger. Uh, that's all it would need to be to show color. It's a bit bigger. Uh, it's letting in more uh, light. Okay, next. This is Lorenzo Lotto's husband and wife. Now, what did th this is sort of significant for you, is it not? Well, because I don't know whether you can see it there, but in the pattern on the tablecloth, there's a point where just to the right of his hand... It goes it, out of focus. It goes out of focus. Uh, now... 
for instance, I'll point out, we only we notice this. I notice this because we have a good colour reproduction. Now, that's only in the last 20 years that you could see that. Meaning, uh, new technology has enabled us to look at this painting. The painting is in St. Petersburg. I'm in LA looking at it in a book. 20 years ago, that painting would, might have been reproduced in black and white, small, and I wouldn't see it. You wouldn't see it. Mm. But we did see it and thought, well, that is clearly out of focus, and he's had to paint it out of focus. And it was that that Charles Falco, when I showed it to him, picked up saying, ah, you can make calculations from this. You well, he, Charles Falco is an optical scientist. He's an optical scientist who came to visit uh, after Ren Wester's piece in the New York. Yeah, this is Lawrence Welchler who uh, wrote first in the New York and then a larger and, piece. Uh, he um, it was, first of all, rather amusing uh, and interesting to meet a scientist. His connection with art was through motorbikes. Yeah. A motorbike in route. fact, he had something, he curated the Guggenheim Helped motorcycle exhibit. Helped art of the motorcycle. Right. And, uh, but he then was very helpful because suddenly he could make, uh, he said, yes, you can calculate things from this. And uh, I'm just working on hunches. But I do know that it will be very difficult to paint that pattern by eye. And if you were doing it by linear perspective, it wouldn't go out of focus. Uh, because you would calcu you could right, calculate right, right, how right, the pattern right, is receding, right, right. you see. For you, how a painting was produced is as important as why. Well, because how images are made just tell us a lot about the images, doesn't it? Even on a television picture it does. How they are made. Who, who is deciding where the edges are? Of course it does. I mean, uh, that would bring us to today as well, I would think. Boy, this is great stuff. Uh, David Hockney's secret knowledge rediscovering the lost techniques of the old masters are there's going to be a what conference meeting debate session uh, at New York University this weekend very limited seating very I'm limited talking. seating so yeah. you may not be able to get in if you go or something uh, but there will be a discussion some smart art historians will be there and whether there's conflict controversy or not uh, they'll talk thank you David pleasure Very good <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Thanks very much.